Welcome to Vision Chats, where the only thing that matters is the future. I am Farooq Day, Vice Provost at Johns Hopkins University, and I'm thrilled today to be with two friends and um, uh, actors, uh, Jordan Baker and Kevin Kerlner, uh, who I have seen in so many shows and movies. Uh, uh, Kevin and Jordan, welcome. It's exciting Thank to have you. Thank, Thank you, Farooq. You. Thank you for having us. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, I'm excited to have a conversation with you today. Uh, let me first introduce you to uh, our audience. Uh, so, Jordan, you've been in Another Earth, The Post, and The Producer. Kevin, you've been in uh, Raising Helen, Cinderella Story, and um, uh, Earth, Final Conflict. Um, Jordan, I know that also you've taken um, uh, your, uh, your acting and your, your craft to help people figure out their next steps in their careers and their lives. So you started oh, yeah, that, that uh, thing awesome. there, yeah. too. Um, and Kevin, I won't um, uh, announce where what you've been filming lately, but I know you've been uh, you've been on location. Uh, you went to Puerto Vallarta. I yeah. stayed home in a freezing cold. It was really, really home, rough. It was really you hard. Went to Puerto right. Vallarta. I like you. Yeah, I like you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hundred feet from the Pacific Ocean. So. Yeah. Now I was there doing a, an Apple Plus TV series that'll drop in November called Acapulco. And uh, prior to that, I was in Atlanta doing a few episodes of uh, the new dynasty that will drop later in uh, August and September. I always get awesome. sent to Brooklyn. That's where I go. <laughs> I get to go. They study her in Brooklyn. So, so I read the application. <laughs> Well, it, it, I'm um, uh, excited to hear all, all about it. You know, the, the, the first thing I want to know is how um, your life evolved into what it is today and how you got into the, um, um, the uh, acting work and uh, the film industry, um, particularly because a lot of people today are thinking about what the next step is for them. So you might have read in a lot of articles that there's been a rise in resignations from um, jobs and careers. People are reprioritizing their lives. They're moving uh, to different states. They're getting either closer to family or moving away from family, however you see it. Um, they're changing jobs. They're changing careers. They're going to, to, to school or going back to school. It feels like the post this pandemic, people are just being braver about life and career decisions and for most of them they're trying to figure it out what is the next step where do i go how do i design my life forward um you've had a lifetime of insights about that given how you've uh, pursued your uh, career and life decisions and choices so i'd love to hear a little bit about your own story and how how it all got started for you and how uh, well, I'm, the, like, um, I'm, 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 kevin's the johns hopkins man oh. so I'm, I'm going to defer to you because he has a very interesting story as we both do in terms of how we became actors, because that was not on the table when we were kids, I don't think. But, um, but tell him, tell him. You're John Hopkins. Well, uh, so <laughs> I graduated from Hopkins. Uh, I was the class of 80. And, uh, and because I sh redshirted a year medically, I, I had a couple, I had a shattered thumb from uh, playing the sport and I got to play it until 1981. Uh, I had a social behavior. I, I have a social and behavioral science degree, a, a bachelor of arts from Hopkins, and uh, you know I emphasized economics. Um, you know, I, I I thought I would go into business. I, I knew nothing but businessmen as examples of what you would do postgraduate. Uh, and in the Hopkins community, you know, most of my teammates and my friends were going off to graduate school, whether it was law or medicine or in many cases, a lot of them went to the finance, the financial industry, um, either to Wall Street or into banking or investment banking. Um, I went that route. I, I joined a, a, a bank that no longer exists, First National Bank of Maryland. I was trained as a credit analyst, um, looking at corporate financial reports, tearing them apart, dissecting them, learning how to do that, uh, doing deep dives and researches on corporations and industries, writing up uh, recommendations on loans and the health of companies and industries and uh, recommendations on, on bank uh, instruments and loans that we would try and connect to corporations. And then I got promoted to being a, a commercial loan officer to Fortune 500 companies in what was called the Maryland Division. So I was uh, servicing corporations that were in the Fortune 500 who had headquarters between Pennsylvania and Northern Virginia, Delaware, and Maryland. Um, and I, it just was not a fit for me. So um, I was there for maybe three months, and then I went back to school. <laughs> I did some strange things. I played a year of semi-pro football at night, uh, two, practicing two nights a week and playing on Saturdays for the, the now defunct 
Baltimore Eagles. And then, um, and I played on the uh, United States. Uh, I played on a club lacrosse team that won the United States championship the following spring. But I was also going to school a couple nights a week and studying. Um, you know, I, I knew I wasn't a, a businessman, so I studied journalism. I studied creative writing, um, fiction writing for a couple semesters, both of those. And then on a whim and still realizing that I don't, you know, writing, I, I guess playing team sports and, and working in, in, in close, I, I played on some very good teams at Hopkins. We had won the national championship um, three times in a row. We were the first team to ever do that in the modern era from 78, 79, and 80. So I like collaborating with people and I like working in a team environment and writing I, not so much as a, a team environment from what I could see. Um, so I took this adult evening uh, education course, Introduction to Acting, that I'd found in a, from like a, an adult evening education uh, newspaper free on the streets of, uh, on Charles Street in downtown Baltimore. And the first night I just got bitten and I just uh, decided, you know, if, I, if I'm an old man someday in a rocking chair, at least if I attempt to go to New York and study acting and, and it doesn't go work out, at least I'll say I tried, you know. Um, long story short, I took another job. I was an office manager for a mortgage banking company. I ended up in a little town called Dothan, Alabama, uh, after I'd spent time in Montgomery, Alabama. Um, and I, I had lived in a trailer in a cornfield with me and a mouse. And uh, <laughs> I had a, a car that had no third gear. And they used to have breakfast together. <laughs> and literally, I'd <laughs> say. feed this mouse in this, in this trailer where he was living in Dothan, <laughs> Alabama. Yeah, and there was a railroad track about 100 meters from there. And when Actually, the train it went really through really good right When then. the train went through at night, the whole trailer literally you know, shook. Um, but uh, uh, I just saved my money, and, and in um, February of uh, eighty, I, I resigned in January of eighty-five, and in February of eighty-five, I was in New York and sleeping on floors, and took a couple jobs, and just started, you know, asking all the the other waiters and, and bartenders that I worked with, you know, who were attempting to become actors, what they did and where they studied, and and it was just a nuts and bolts kind of like from the streets up by you know by me just being curious. I took a lot of people out to lunch. I bought a lot of people a cup of coffee, asked lots of questions. I, I, I very, very, very fortunately ended up with some, uh, you know, a really fine teacher, um, a woman named Catherine Gately, who had the Rutgers connection, who had, had her own studio. And I studied in a studio program. I also studied voice and diction and movement. And, um, and I just happened to have uh, meet two women who took me under their wing, who were managers of children. And even though I was an, a full-grown adult then, they, uh, and I was kind of old for them, as they told me, um, they just took a flyer on me and it ended up, um, that I ended up starting to work. And I, I kind of learned it from just learning from doing lots of commercials and industrial films, training films for corporations, and then uh, studying acting at night. Um, so that's, that's sort of, you know, my kind of five minute, <laughs> story whatever i you know I, I, from new york I, I i was doing regional theater and then i got lucky and got a um a lead in a television movie the week that was a backdoor pilot for a possible tv series it took me to los angeles got me an la agent and uh and hawaii and you there. went to hawaii <laughs> you have such location <laughs> bitterness i do i do <laughs> Yes, because you worked at the Cleveland place. I know. I got the cold places. <laughs> Brooklyn, it's Cleveland, like, Norfolk, Virginia. Okay. You know, it's like he could stay go to Hawaii. And, 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 <laughs> that's, that's, uh, for him. <laughs> uh, and there were, and, and I will say this: there, there, uh, there's been several times when I've wanted to walk away from it. Um, I remember after my tenth year of doing it, I was thirty six, thirty seven. And, um, you know, I was really kind of done. I went up to Columbia and I got their master's packets for creative writing or um, literature and thought I would go back to school and do that because my career had definitely plateaued and I just was not interested in, in being on the, um, you know, just hanging in there, so to speak. And uh, there have been other times too. Um, and so it, I, I don't want anybody to think that it was some uh, 45 degree upward trajectory of, on a graph chart, you know, just really there's a lot. If, if you are in the creative arts, I don't care what it is you do, sculptor, whatever. I mean, they're, they're painter, it, writer, you know, there's just these big hills and valleys. And yeah. you, know, just, you just have to uh, 
you just have to love it so much that you can do it for almost free. You know, you know K- K- Kevin, so there's there's so many lessons in just the the, the story you shared with us here briefly. Um, you know, I always uh, say that you, you, you may not be able to bring luck to your doorstep, but you can put yourself on the path of luck. Um, and that's by making these moves, by making these audacious moves, as I call them. Um, you know, I, I teach our students and, and even our, our, our staff that the, the, the best way to do this is to find your curiosity and get inspired, which you clearly have been. And then you actually make an audacious move. You have to be brave with some type of decision and some choice. But what I realized listening to you is that I don't necessarily say what happens next. And you just completed that um, circle for me, if you will, that uh, what, what happens after that is that you kind of meet a lot of people and try try a bunch of stuff until eventually you meet the right person in the right place at the right time. And that person might open the right door for you. And that's what happens to you is that, you know, what happens once you make the audacious move and move to New York city or to uh, you, uh, you, you take this night course, et cetera. Well, it's not going to just fall from the sky. You're just really going to have to put yourself on the path of that luck and, uh, meet as many people as possible. So taking folks to coffee and lunch and asking lots of questions as you have is what's going to increase the likelihood that chance, that chance event is going to, uh, to occur. Um, and then eventually you get that, that, that big break. Was that the same? Um, um, uh, there are similarities there for you, Jordan, and, and the way how things. Uh, 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 my, my path is absolute adversity. People telling me no. Mm. And I, to this day, when I look back at my, my beginnings, I, I don't know what inside of me just kept plugging along. Um, but I, I grew up in Los Angeles and um, I was taking ballet from the time I was three. And um, my parents got divorced my senior year of high school. So they weren't quite paying attention to what was going to happen to me next. And so it was just decided that I, my mother was moving to New York. She was a fashion designer there. And she took me and my little brother to New York. And just before we left, my mom put me in a six-week acting course at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts in Pasadena for the summer. And her intention was that um, I would learn to talk because I was very, very shy. I was very quiet. And um, when I took that class, I would throw up every day. I would drive down to Pasadena (laughs) and basically want to throw up. I mean, I was so frightened all the time. But I did a scene one day, and the teacher said, what you're doing, he said, you make a fine actor and you should go to our school in New York. So when I got to New York, um, I did apply to the American Academy and I got in. And after two years there, they made it pretty clear that I would not be an actor. I was a very good typist. I typed really fast. And um, so they re- recommended some secretarial school, I think the Barbizon School of something. And um, I got a postcard in the mail in August from Marymount Manhattan College. I filled it out. I think they got my college, my, my high school transcript. And two weeks later in September, I was in college. Um, on my own, my own drive to do something, I have to do something. I'm not going to be an actor. And while I was there, there was a teacher, Bill Bordeaux, who's now passed away. But, you know, there's that one person who suddenly sees you, I think. And that guy saw me and they started looking at my writing and, um, they told me that I was writing at a level that they just didn't teach there, that I could go to a much better school. And so they helped me to transfer. And um, I got into old Sarah Lawrence at NYU, but at the end of the day, my father, because Smith College accepted me as a junior with my work from the academy, I ended up at Smith College in Massachusetts. Mm-hmm. And I got very deep into, I didn't, I wasn't an active major, I was liberal arts. And, um, but I still played around at the theater, did shows there. And um, did the American College Theater Festival, came in second, I think, to Steve Culp, I think he's kind of well known. Um, and, then, um, and then I did something called the University Residential Theater Association, which was a competition. And I got into that. And that sent me into New York to the finals of that. And, um, and that's where I met William Esper, um, the Esper Studios in New York. And he gave me a scholarship to Rutgers. And I ended up at Mason Grove School of the Arts. And I did three years of a master's degree there. And then we did a showcase and I got an agent and I went to work. And one of my claim to fame is when I was cast in Edward Albee's Three Tall Women. And we went on, he went on to win the Pulitzer for that in uh, 94. But I remember being in my little dressing room in uh, Woodstock is where we started in the summer, getting a letter from the American Academy of Dramatic Arts congratulating me 
um, on this achievement. And, um, and I thought, wow, I, how did I do this? I mean, every, every step along the way, but that one person who finally said, you know, you could do this, you know, and my height's a problem, you know, I'm six feet tall. Um, and so that became a problem. But, you know, in terms of three tall women, it became my asset. You know, and that's what William Esper said to me. He said, look, your height, it could be the cross you bear, but it all might, it might also be the reason you get a great job. And a great husband. So, <laughs> you might be tall. But I, I'm just I know, saying. In terms of this conversation, you know, um, Kevin and I, I've done Broadway and I went, we went out to Los Angeles. I've worked abroad in England and places. Um, I've had, we both had about 35 years uh, doing work. I mean, our, most of our job is auditioning for work. Uh, we deal with a lot of daily rejection. We don't think about it that way. We just say, you know, throw it to the wall. If it sticks, great. Um, in some ways, you can control some of that now because of the ownership of the technology. Um, what happened to me, I'm just going to move on to COVID, is that, yeah, I founded a wonderful little company called Room for Thought, where I was working with artists, teaching them how to build a business in this new world. But then when COVID hit, there was none of the places I could send them to start that because everything had shut down. And um, in that time, I started writing again, like really writing. And, um, and I saw a post. Um, they were Rutgers was looking for they had some openings for a graduate program in playwriting. And I thought I had been accepted to a few playwriting conferences. And um, I thought, maybe I'll apply for that. And they encouraged me to apply. And then they rejected me. And I thought, God, with all the rejections I have gotten in acting, that one hurt. That one hurt. Yeah. So, but then I sat quietly with myself and I said, yeah, you probably didn't deserve that because you haven't done your work in that area. So I didn't give up. And maybe that's what I did when I was young with acting as well, is that I'm never going to be found. I got to do the work. And um, so I've discovered um, at Sarah Lawrence College that they have a continuing education in writing. They have a beautiful writing program and it's nearby. And so right now it's virtual. So I went back to school. I just finished a course and I'm starting another one in January, in, in July. Um, I just decided to really start to improve my writing skills. And then maybe I could take that next step to do what I want to do with that. And I love acting. I can't imagine a day when I would not be an actor, but I can imagine a day when it is not first and foremost in my thoughts and rather my writing uh, might take um, a position that I've wanted to do for a long time and have that control. Unlike Kevin, I love solitude. I love it. And um, I do like creating something with a group, but I really do also really love to be alone with my thoughts and, and do that. So I think skill sets, you know, when you look at, in Room for Thought, I have my students take really deep dives on what they can do. And sometimes those dives go all the way down to, I mean, I made a list, like I made great chocolate cake. You know, there are people who have built industries off of something as simple as that. Companies. You know, whole companies yeah. off of that. Actors like the Little Pie Company. He was on Broadway, that guy. He was a great song and dance guy. He just happened to make a really good apple pie. So he opened the Little Pie Shop and it just took off. So you don't know. And he's happy. He's really happy. He's still song and dance guy, but he makes pies, you know. So your skill sets, what makes you happy um, can be important. And where is your greatest use uh, with that great, that skill set? Because that gives you significance. And that's one thing I think we really want is significance, like a reason to be here. And um, how can you be useful with some unusual little talent you might have? Yeah, you know, I'm oh, sorry for it. Go ahead. Go ahead, Kevin. It's okay. Well, no, I, I, it's so funny because several of my friends at Hopkins and former teammates of mine uh, who are like blood brothers to me, um, when I would see them, they would say, I, who's ever done that from Hopkins? I mean, like, I was like, well, John Aston, you know, went to Hopkins. He, he went on the, to, you know, the Adams family. And they said, yeah, but who else? And they, like, they, we, Hopkins doesn't produce actors. And it's so interesting because the thing I couldn't stop fantasizing about and thinking about and was curious about was just like, I just am so, I want, how do you do that? How do you do that? How do you do that? And, juxt and, and at the same time, the more I went into it, the more frightened I became. Mm -hmm. because I became conscious of what it would take and also of, of some things that it would take. Of course, I didn't know everything. And I also uh, knew that uh, this was a field where 
I, I didn't know if there was a, a big support network, Hopkins people I could rely on, contacts, blah, blah, blah. And yet, um, what's really interesting is that that thing that frightens you the most, that is also the thing that you can't stop daydreaming and night dreaming and fantasizing about. If you, if you can hold those two things in, 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 on both sides of your brain at the same time and just keep moving forward, as you pointed out, for just keep you know, meeting people or asking questions or having that cup of coffee or doing a deep dive, um, the thing that terrifies you is probably the thing that would most satisfy you, whatever that thing is. Uh, however far off it seems, however complex or impossible it seems, um, because there's a kind of joy that we have when we're doing it at a high level, you know, on stage or in front of a camera, you know, and everything it takes to get to those places and all the, you know, the thousands and thousands of, of hours of training and, you know, hard work trying to get the gig and, and pursuing it and everything and preparing for it and researching it, the, the role and everything. That, um, it all comes together at some point. So, you know, especially for young people watching this, I would just say that that thing that, that you can't get out of your consciousness that also might terrify you, don't let it make you go away. Just keep moving forward. How do you deal with that um, uh, emotion as you move forward, the emotion of uh, fear, but also of getting over rejection? I know, Jordan, you talked a little bit about that. Like that, that one hurt. The one that, that one hurt. hurt. Yeah. What well, it, my, my, what, my what about it? Why, did, why, why did it hurt so much? And, uh, and how does one uh, get over um, that? And by I, the way, when you, when you said that one hurt, I have a feeling that everybody listening identified with that because we all had that experience. Absolutely. Well, going after something that we really wanted. And yep. there's always, you know, in acting, there's always occasionally, not all jobs are great jobs, you know. <laughs> most aren't. <laughs> most aren't. And you could probably, most actors will say in terms of theater, there might be four or five in your career of, of theater that mm -hmm. was really something that made the mark or was really important work that you did. And then the rest of it's a job. And um, I don't know, you know, there's so there's a few auditions we do. And I think Kevin mean, <laughs> had to go sit down for a few days to lose that job, you know. Um, but I don't know with with, uh, re you know, I don't it's interesting about this new thing because, you know, we don't go into rooms anymore. We audition self tape virtually here in my office. I put a little thing yeah, behind me. put it in a Dropbox file. So we don't Shoot feel the rejection. The tape just goes and you never hear from them, you never hear from them, you know. But, yeah. um, but in the room, you, you hear that, thank you. <laughs> like, yeah, you can tell by the tone of voice. Next, you know. Mm -hmm. and, so, um, so tell yeah. us about that audition process. What, what, what is that like? And like, is there a weird story you've had? Or probably you have a bunch of them. That, well, uh, auditioning. Like, I, I do teach this on, on auditioning. You know, auditions are like you're invited to this really wonderful party. And, and so what do you do? You know, you say, oh, oh, I got an invitation to this. How am I going to dress? Oh, so I go out. Maybe I shop a few dresses like that. And then maybe I try on 10 dresses. But there's only one that I think is going to be right for that particular party, right? So then I go and I show up and then they decide I'm not the dress for their party. So that's all it is. I'm a great dress. I'm just not that for that party. And many times the job I lose are jobs that, thank God, I lost them. I had an agent who used to say to me, rejection is protection. Mm. Um, and so I would say, oh, it's so I follow a job that I wanted and say, oh, yeah, oh, hmm, thank God I didn't get that one, you know, because it can go south, you know. So for us, you know, I think we go in and out of rooms so much. We can go in and when we were young, I mean, God, you could go into six or seven rooms in a day. Yeah. And so we, the rejections didn't matter anymore. What would really start to matter is if it slowed down, like you only had one a month, you know, then you start to feel it a bit. Am I in the right profession? Am I doing the right thing? Because I can't make a living if I'm not going into more, you know, I think in sales, they say 15 no's to a yes. Yeah. So that's an average. That's a, if you, in sales, you have to get 15 no's before you're going to hit that yes to get the sale. So I would walk into rooms and say, say no, just say no. Feather in my cap, moving on. 
say no, go ahead. I'm waiting for number 15, you know? And so it just became easier. I don't take it personally uh, when someone says no. I don't know what, what, what they're doing. And there, there, there are know? all sorts of different uh, emotions that you have when, especially when it's an audition that you say, you know, like, you know, that say it's a, uh, you know, I, I, I did enemy, an enemy of the people uh, at Baltimore Center Stage and it's in play that I actually really wanted to do because the, the, it was so beautifully written and there's a complexity to it and, it was, and, it, and an environmental theme to it that I thought, oh, I, I, I want all these themes to come out about it. And two brothers, you know, um, uh, you know the, 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 the brother who's, who's a more business oriented as opposed to the brother who's more humanity oriented, so to speak. Uh, to give it, you know, a real thumbnail sketch. But, you know, if I hadn't gotten that, then, you know, I, 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 you know, I go through like all this, I, there's a part of me that gets really mad. And I usually go just in my head, I just kind of go, well, fuck them. They don't know. They don't know what they <laughs> just lost. They no, they don't know what they've just lost. And, you know, it's their <laughs> loss. I literally go like that. So I'm just, I go from anger to, and then I say to myself, it's kind of what Jordan said. And then I go, you know, no, they actually knew that I was a really good actor. They just they just see it with a different uh, visually. You know, there's a certain kind of energy in it. Of course, the problem with an actor is is that you have to somehow detach yourself from. You know, I I can't not be six feet three inches. I can't not be a a, a white male who you know used to be a leading man, and now that I'm over the age of sixty, I'm you know I'm I'm a character actor. I, those things are just they are what they are, and. If they're looking for someone who's a little bit younger than me or a little bit older or I, I'm too big, I've, I've, I've lost so many roles because the leading lady is literally five foot five. And they just go, well, how does that work? He looks like a giant next to her. And, it, you know, I always say you can see it in life every day if you look at couples. So I don't understand. And there's these things called Apple boxes and most everything in film and television is shot in close up. So who would care? But they seem to care. You know, if there's idiotic reasons why you lose the job and there are profound, important reasons why you lose the job. You just um, you move on because. You know, look, it, I, I always end up in a place like, well, they didn't kill me. They can't kill me. So I just have to, and they, they don't know what they've lost. So I just have to go back at it type of, of, of thing. There's always um, another one. It's, just, it's like a bus. Yeah, there's another one. Hopefully it'll be interesting. You know? I, I think or that, you make your own work. That's the big thing right now is to make your own work. I think what's great and about other diversity. industries and, and because of, of COVID and the world had took a big pause and it's given people the psychological courage to say, I am, um, I am not going to wait any longer. I'm going to pursue that other thing or I'm going to pursue that other company and just get out of this company. Um, what's great about that is, is that for, for we as actors, we know every gig ends. Even if it's a play and you have a long-term run, I mean, Jordan did over 700 performances of Three Tall Women over two years, eight shows a week. Um, but she knew that gig was going to eventually end. Uh, we do regional theater. It's typically a three-week rehearsal, three-week run, sometimes a four-week rehearsal, four-week run at the bigger houses. But, you know, that's two months, and you know you're, you're done after that. Or, you know, you do like three days on a film, and you go, well, at the end of that third day, I'm finished, you know. You, what's kind of great is that what, what we've learned is, is that it's uh, – there's just the, – the un – the void of not knowing what will happen next is kind of exciting and uh, just a, the excitement of some new opportunity. So if you're in another industry and you want to switch companies and you say, you know what, this is my time to leave the uh, uh, student design center at Johns Hopkins and really pursue the thing that I really want to do, which is become a marine biologist, you know, God bless you and bully for you because uh, life, you know, it's nothing but, uh, there's just nothing but finite endings. The only thing, the only force in this world that the physicists will tell you it wins is, is gravity. And the gravity of the end of a, of a gig or a job and the gravity of the end of life. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, 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 I, it, it's about learning to, um, all the things that I didn't know that I didn't realize that the next job or the next opportunity, the next gig would teach me. I'm just grateful for the turnover. I'm grateful for not knowing. We wake up every January 1st kind of going, wonder what this year holds. We don't know who we're going to work for. <laughs> where we're going to be. We don't know where the next paycheck's coming from. Nothing. Usually nothing. We're good at saving. <laughs>
<laughs> I say like for, for those who really value uh, job security, how, how do they manage? Um, There's no uh, job security. It doesn't matter what you do. There is no job security. That is a myth. Um, you know, my father, who worked um, for um, in the brokerage business, he was a manager, one of the first of the Merrill Lynch training programs. And they sent him to California in 58 because there were no brokerage offices in California, if you can imagine that day. But he would say, you know, every year his, he, his job came up. His job came up for renewals, like basically like that. There were always, he was always being tested. And I said, it's interesting because you think about my father's generation were men who stayed in businesses for their whole careers 40, and then retired and got their years. pension packages, but not true. And, you know, I think when I got out of grad school, I went to work as a temp, you know, I was the fast typist. And so I went to work through a temp agency. I always recommend this actually to my students in New York, you could go uh, to a temp agency and they would send me to these extraordinary companies. Um, and I'd be like an executive secretary, but as a temp, it allowed me to leave to go to my auditions mm. because I'm not a permanent employee. But New York started to do this thing, and maybe it was going on nationwide, but permanent temps. Corporate America was stopping hiring full-time employees, and they were using these temporary employees, and we would just be there forever. And I would book a theater gig, and I'd go down maybe to Chicago or someplace and do a play for six weeks, and they would hold my temporary job. They get a temporary for my temporary job. Then I'd come back and I'd work for the company. And they didn't have to give me any benefits. They just had to pay me on a weekly salary like that. And I worked for wonderful companies. And one even wanted me to become a permanent employee and go off to England and work there. And uh, I said, no, I'm an actor. I sort of stuck to my guns of what I was going to be. But um, it, corporate America was really shifting. And um, for us as actors, we are always temporary employees. We know that the job begins and it ends. We spend more time looking for the job than actually doing the job. So for us, the real creative act is what do we do with our downtime? Because we spend a lot of time unemployed. And so we're trying to be creative. So some have day jobs. People go off and, you know, the thing is about restaurants and bartenders and who are your service provider or somebody in the arts, right? Um, at the SD Lauder Corporation, where I had my temp job, we had ballerinas there and jazz musicians and set designers. And it was this wild group of creative people uh, working in corporate America to sustain ourselves while we were trying to do our gig. I, I think Kevin makes a joke about, uh, I've done three tall women and we were in Time Magazine and Newsweek had won this Pulitzer. And I remember an executive coming in and holding up Time Magazine and going, is that you? And I said, yeah, why are you here? Is it earning a living because, you know, we don't get paid much in the theater. The theater salary is not, you can't live on that. That's why we do television and film um, because they have what's called a residual income. So once you do the job, it keeps paying. Every time somebody watches that, there's money that comes from that. But also, you know, in the gig economy, this has become even, even easier. We have a friend of ours, a dear friend, whose son, um, well, both of his children graduated from Harvard. His son graduated with a, 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 a math degree from Harvard. And he's been in Brooklyn for like four years now. And he wanted to get into some form of design, especially uh, art installations of all kinds. But of course, he didn't know how to get started. And it doesn't pay that much if you're the designer for, let's say, everything from a musician to a fine artist to uh, anyone else that wants the, an interior space designed. So what did he do? He took his math degree from Harvard and he tutored students. That's how he paid all his bills for four years. He just figured out in the last year and a half that he really wanted to become an architect and he just got accepted to MIT's architect, the School of Architecture, one of the finest in the country. So in a gig economy, whatever your degree is in, you can always be a tutor. You can always uh, teach or, or you can do, there's lots of things you can do uh, online now that weren't even available with it when it wasn't in a, you know, without the internet and without a gig economy. So it's, it's even easier now to design a, a something that quote unquote pays the bills. You know, in my day, I uh, ended up doing a lot of cater waitering and all the waiters used to say, you know, why don't you join us tomorrow night and tomorrow night, tomorrow night, you know, we could get five, six gigs a week. You'll be making, you know, a couple thousand dollars a week, you know? And I, and I said, no, I need two night, two gigs a week. 
because I'm not here to be a, become a professional gator waiter. I'm here to become a professional actor. The other nights, I'm going down to TKTS and I'm buying it in those days a $25 ticket to see a Broadway show to study somebody, at, at, you know, to see their acting, to, to study, you know, plays and theater. I didn't want to work that much more. So, but in a gig economy, you can design just enough work to pay your rent and pay your bills and pursue that thing that's not going to pay you for a while, but that gives you joy and maybe tremendous fear at the same time, as I was saying before, and you just keep pushing down that path until and talking to people and being, you know, nothing, two things, work like a, a pack horse on a hot day, you know, going in the Grand Canyon, work like a pack mule, and at the same time, be so curious just, just keep, you know, whatever it takes to fuel your curiosity for that thing that just is like in the back of your mind, itching at you going, I think I could do that. I wonder if I could do that. I, I, I think I'd be good at that. I, I, I'm so interested in that. Why is it that that way? Why is it that way? That, I, I want to know why it's that way. Well, get into it. You know, there's a way, so much more flexibility now than even you know, this. Um in my graduate class at Rutgers, William Esper would always say, you know, only one or two of you are actually going to become actors. And they're all sitting there like, I'm in a graduate program. I'm going to go become you know, an actor. Other kids, yeah. With 15 yeah. other students. Yeah. And, and he was right, actually. Um, one went off to become one of the world-class fight choreographers, um, Rick Sordelay. Um, a couple of us became actors. Some founded some theater companies. You know, one of the interesting things was uh, one girl in, at Rutgers at that time is now the top DA in Brooklyn, uh, handing, uh, handling jury trials, you know, because her ability to perform in front of a, a jury. To tell know? a story. And so I always tell students and parents as well, I said, what this work that we do doesn't necessarily mean that your child might become an actor or performer. They might use this skill set to do something quite different with it. I mean, we had presidents, right, who were actors. Um, I, I just, you never know where it's going to go, but your ability to communicate and to listen at a really deep level are some of the skill sets that actors learn. And I, I still think that students who go to college should at least get one year, every student should have one year of beginning acting, um, just to have the ability to make eye contact, you know, to repeat what they're seeing, um, to listen at that level. Um, because I, my students are so scattered when they come to me in the beginning, so scattered, so frightened of each other. Um, it's all a play. And, you know, now we've got them, they're all like this, right? So the idea of actually looking into a, you know, flesh and bloods and bone person, right? So that, that skill set, my ability to go into any room and feel comfortable now, where I was so frightened all the time when I was 17, 18, 19, um, to go into a room and, and make eye contact and want to be curious and interested in another person, you know, um, those skill sets are invaluable for anything you want to do. So and now you're teaching them how to do it virtually too. So like, oh, it's unbelievable! You should see John Aston. John Aston was the guy. I, I was I was sitting in on his classes before I started to teach at AMDA, and um, I was I thought, how are you going to teach acting on Zoom? Yeah, right, but. He did it. I mean, the guy really, he figured it out. And, um, and then I got to AMDA and they had, they had been doing it for a year and they had some ways of doing it. So it was 50, 50, we were 50% in the classroom and 50% on the zoom and, um, how hard to act with a mask on, you know, and social distance and all of that. So it's much better actually on the zoom during this time. You know, when I was at Hopkins, I took public speaking and it was one of my favorite classes undergraduate at Hopkins. And, um, you know, the, for all the, the incredible benefits of technology, um, it, it really uh, has taken us away from um, listening and making eye contact and really having uh, comfort in a room. Um, Jason Alexander, who's very famous um, in, from Seinfeld, Jason uh, was an old um, colleague, I'll say, or he was a friend as well, but uh, we had the same manager. And I went out to lunch with him many times. I took him out to lunch many times. And he's the, he was the first person that said to me, you know, Kevin, when you have to walk into a room of people to make a presentation in anything you do, and in our case, audition, there are three parts of that. The first part, the first third, is when you, from the time that door opens and they see you until the moment that you have to actually 
do your scenes or in the case of uh, anyone, either in academia, science or business, make your pitch. Then you have to do the pitch and you have to actually really know what you're doing. You have to actually really know in the complete backwards and forwards of what it is you're talking about. And then when you finish that, there's the, the, the last third is from the moment that you finish to, and you're with these people to the moment that you close that door again. And we humans are instinctive. We are, we are, um, uh, you know, psychologically that, you know, we're using our, 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 um, our limbic system when we meet someone for the first time and it's our nervous system It's the fight or flight system. You know, there's two big uh, nervous cords that go down your spine on either side, you know, that, that really goes back, you know, 300,000 years. So people almost have a sense of you. They're almost like sniffing you out and smelling you as, as, as we would in a pack. I like to say, do they want to go camping with me? Right. And so <laughs> Jason, a big piece of work. And Jason was the thing, he, said, like. he said, how you are in the room is not who you are as a human being, but you know, making the room move toward you with self-deprecating humor, for example, mm -hmm. uh, or noticing someone and complimenting them or um, talking about how crazy the weather is today. There's a whole skill set to that that you have to know on top of the skill set of the material itself, whatever that material is, and the storytelling power of that material, like that you, know, that you have an arc to that material and you start here and then you build to this place and then you bring your audience to there, to now your presentation has ended to the moment now that it's ended that you use dry, dry self-deprecating humor again and, and putting people at ease and, and seeing everyone in that room. I mean, these are skill sets that people are gonna need, are gonna need as much as they're gonna need their cell phone and their, and their bullet point presentations and their graphs and charts. You can know all of that stuff that you will still need the human element and actors know how important that I'm is. I'm gonna add one more thing to that. Um, in terms of uh, meetings, um, the first step is the preparation. And so, um, you know, I get, a, I get an interview, a call sheet, basically. There's all these names on there. Um, before I even confirm that I'd like to go in on that job, um, I do it. The lovely thing about all the technology is I can do a deep dive on every name. I can Google every name and say, oh, oh, they did. Oh, I, yeah, I'd like to meet that person. So now it's not even about the job. It's just like I'd like to get in the room. I'd like to have a few minutes with that person because I'm interested in what they do. Right. Then and that it also reduces your fear because now you're interested in the person yeah, as opposed to you performing. Knowledge Take always reduces yourself. fear. It's the unknown that we're frightened of. So you get as much knowledge as possible. I want to know who the casting director is. They're probably the most important person in the room because these other people are going to go away, but the casting person is his, you know, got all the jobs. So the thing is, um, the preparation of going into the room, making sure you know your material, that you've looked at that material from three or four different angles because if a director starts to say something to you, and I don't know, it doesn't matter any business, I suppose, if the person you're interviewing with starts to ask some questions or guide you in a cup, can you fly with them in another different direction? Are you just in one little cubby hole there? Um, so sometimes they say in acting, you know, when you show up and you give the writer, you don't give the writer what they wrote, you're not coming back. You come in, you give the writer what they wrote. Well, you, you might get a call back on that. But if you can find something in their writing that they can't even see, most likely you're booking that job. And that's probably true of most oh. industries. You know, if you can see something about them and take that into the room and in some way um, reveal that to them about themselves, I see this about you, they're going to be very interested in you, very interested oh. in what you've got. Do you hear that, everybody? Like, that is the, just one of the best okay. lessons. I will tell one fun, funny thing is Kevin will remember this. I had a pair of striped pants. I, they were very expensive pants, but I got them on sale in Los Angeles. They were made by oh. Missoni. Expensive pants. And um, I would put them on with a pair of tennis shoes and a sweater, and I'd go in for these sitcoms. And I, you know, I booked these sitcoms all the time. And, and when I they were on, very tight fitting <laughs> pants. They were, just striped. That they were striped. And so and they were kind of odd. And because it's comedy. And, um, and I would always hear this. I'd open up the door, I'd walk in, and, and there were all these men. It was always, now, now it's mixed. It's kind of nice. When I go to the room, but it was always these men. It's not as good as and I'd room. walk into the room, and the first thing I'd hear would be, nice pants. And so I go, yeah, get booking this job. So <laughs> then I do my thing. 
So I went home to Kevin one time and I said, what is it that you see when you look at those pants? And he said, those pants are very complicated. He said, there's something about those pants that makes me think you know something I don't know. And so I want to go there wherever you're going because you seem to know something. So that thing taught me a lesson. It wasn't just the, not the tight pants, but they were, they were um, creatively, there was something going on there. And I say that about how you dress for an interview, particularly for actors, you know, to how you dress for that success. And our field is a little different than going into corporate America. But, you know, we have to play corporate America sometimes. Yeah. So are we always walking in in a black suit or a brown suit? Um, L.A. Law put me in a peach suit that was so stunning. I bought it and then I would wear it to auditions and it made all the difference because they were so tired of these black, brown, and navy suits walking in, that when, it, when I walked in with this color, and it was a really a beautiful suit, it just said something different about me that I was thinking in a different direction about something. And it's stupid, it's little stuff, but, but when it had meaning. But when you're working in any, uh, in any work environment, what's kind of great is, is that all of that can either really piss you off because there's so many levels and you think, you know, why should I care about what I wear to as long as it's like professional and clean and doesn't smell like it do, does it really matter? This guy. Well, you know, it really does matter. And 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 here's the thing, instead of that irritating anyone, you know, let's say you're an art history major and you're going in to do a presentation or maybe just to do a job interview. What is the art, the artistry in you that you want reflected in everything you're wearing? in how you present, yourself. present yourself in the room and how you put the, in the kind of artistry that's going on between what you're saying between you and those other people. There's an artistry there that has art history built into it too, because you're kind of an artist of yourself. Them. Know you're who an you're meeting. Yourself. Don't walk in blind. Right. Yeah. And, then, and then, so much information. And the art history in the people you're meeting. If you're a physicist, what you wear, how does that reflect what kind of physicist you are and, and the colors that you see in the laws of physics? And then if you're doing that presentation, how would you speak to the, the physicist in the, in, in, in the people that you're meeting? What's, what are the colors of their physics? What, what is the language that um, excites you in them? So what's really cool about being a geek about anything is that you care about every little there's just levels beyond levels beyond levels. You know, like I said, Jordan did over 700 performances of a play that won the Pulitzer Prize and she and the other two women were absolutely brilliant. And yet they will tell you, as any actor will tell you, that on our last day of our last performance, even if it's over the 700th one, there was still more to learn. There was still more that I didn't discover. And Actors who have been in long runs, they kind of, people say, well, how do you do that? Well, yeah, you, you get to these places where you do feel stale. You go back to the text, you start imagining again, you start thinking about words and moments and you dig into every single word, every single sentence, every single moment, and you start daydreaming again. And you would do that in any profession, in any, if you were, my mom taught kindergarten for 30 years. She would think, you know, how can I become a better kindergarten teacher? How, what, what can I do this year that I didn't do last year that I've never tried? You know, there's this new thing. And maybe I should, you know, I mean, it, it goes for whatever it is you do. I think also we haven't talked about is uh, if you thought this is who I'm supposed to be and you've been going down a track and you see something over to the left and you think, oh, no, I better not. I'm supposed to be doing this. The hardest part then is to say, but why am I looking over there? <laughs> what, what am I looking for over there? And sometimes um, I would say to students, what would need to change in order for you to be able to do that? Sometimes we can't walk directly into something. Sometimes we see it and we can't go there. Some other image of ourselves or whatever we're, we're thinking about what that might be and we're afraid of it. Sometimes I say, you know, just could you take two steps back and think of another way to go there. So if I want to be a writer, but I still want to be an actor, well, maybe I just need to step back, take a couple of non-credit courses in writing. And she was great, this teacher at Southern. She said, submit, submit. You're ready. I said, submit. What? She said, just do it. So I didn't have to give up acting 
to write some things, to have someone tell me I could go just start, just start. And, and so there's a way to sort of step back and you can have that and continue this until suddenly this doesn't make sense anymore. And that makes a lot of sense. And you might find your happiness there. So what would need to change? What little adjustment might you need to make to have that while doing this? Mm -hmm. um, is very, very useful. And for me anyway, because I, I have a really hard time. It feels like failure. You know, it's ridiculous. I have 35 years in the field. I could walk away from acting tomorrow quite confident that I did a good job. But to leave, to just stop, cut it off, call my agent, say bye-bye, go in another way. It feels like failure to me. It's an odd feeling until I get something else maybe under it, but I still feel with actors, you know. Well, what are they, what, what's that old story that? about Thomas Edison? And somebody said to him, you had, you had well over uh, 1,800 failed experiments before the light bulb. And he, he, <laughs> he, he, he said, but, but what did you think of all those failures? And he said, they, weren't, they were just 1,800 steps toward me finally yep. cracking it. This. You know, and so it's, it's, look, it's not easy. And we still both fail. I know I do um, at uh, looking at us like an audition or, or even a gig that I've got and kind of go, you know, I just did one in last uh, November and I, I looked at it again recently and I went, you know what? There were two scenes and there were two moments in two scenes that I know I made the wrong choice and I want, I want them back. But I, I'm not going to crucify myself over that. I'm just going to say, you know what? Next time, don't bury yourself in your activity. Stay that that moment's too important there. Um, you know, I just just learn from it and try and take that self criticism or what you think is a failure and say, I'm gonna I'm gonna next time I'm gonna I'm gonna just just do it differently. I'm just gonna I'm gonna change it. I'm going to, you know, that's how you, you know, you, that's how we all learn. I mean, mostly we learn from failing. Any neurologist will tell you that, that neural pathways are the deepest and those things that cause the most pain and failure. All right. How, how has your industry changed in the last year um, as a result of the pandemic? Where do you think it's, it's going? Yeah. Well, I mean, definitely, I mean, theater is not back. We're coming back in New York, I think, on a temporary kind of smaller... And I think they're only doing Thursdays, Saturdays, Sundays, something like, or Mondays, no Mondays, they were dark on Mondays. They're trying to sort of bring it back. Um, but film, television, commercial work, um, it did, it stopped, but it came back first because they could figure out a, a, a way to social distance, um, to test and, um, and go back to work and get some of that going. But the thing for us that really changed is the fact that we don't go into rooms to audition and that was really, I mean, at the end of the day, it was costly, you know, you, you get dressed, you drive in, you park, um, some, a casting director has to rent space, um, they can only see a certain number of people a day that way. Um, so now we get it, we, we had to set up lights like everybody else, and we have, you know, different backdrops. There, that we there, there was an investment that we had to make in, he has in a, equipment, lights, yeah, voiceover back, booth, backdrops, right? uh, you know, in the case of if you do voice work yeah. or voiceover booth, I mean, we spent several thousand dollars, as as a lot of people did, it's putting putting their business. office at home, and that's what we did. We started yeah. operating from home, uh, you know, and it's all done by internet now. So remote. now, with I think on sets, I, it'll be interesting to see. I went back. I did a Blue Bloods. I did a New Amsterdam. Kevin's done a few TV shows and some film. Uh, for us right now, because of the COVID restrictions. Um, a lot of things changed on set. It also changed in terms of size of the crew. Um, uh, no more dollying shots. <laughs> we were seeing that. We were just seeing handheld. Uh, don't use props. We're just going to shoot you from here up and send you home, you know. And I think that uh, some of those discoveries uh, might remain, you know. I'd be curious to see if the big crews come back um, or if they haven't figured out how to do it with those smaller crews. Um, a lot, a craft lot. services went away. I remember that went away. The food industry went away. They, you couldn't eat on set. Um, so you do your own thing. I'm trying to think. I just think like so many other industries that we, we are, uh, we are uh, being told to be more self-reliant. Yeah. And um, look, uh, the fact that you can now film a movie on your camera and you can use uh, Final Cut Pro and make your own movies the, the dem just like lots of other industries, the democratization of, of film and television and 
you know, it, it, frankly, theaters, it's happening too. I mean, there's, there's people are putting up plays everywhere in all sorts of spaces now. Um, you know, the, this shakeup is a, is a really, you know, good thing. Do we know once we get past this year and we really have maybe, you know, gotten to a herd immunity or these, um, all the uh, COVID, um, you know. Yeah, I'm thinking you know, fall 22. You know, do, do we know how it's, in other words, do we know how it's going to finally shake out? No, we don't know how it's going to finally shake out. But um, one of the things that's really great is that the industry is not centralized in LA and Hollywood right. or New York anymore. You know, Jordan and I, you know, I've, I've, there's lots of industry in Atlanta. There's lots of industry in New Mexico. Usually these are done for Maryland. Econ economic, <laughs> well, economic reasons, you know, tax breaks uh, do bring um, in film and television. Um, and um, the equipment has gotten smaller, lighter, and, um, and again, yeah, everybody has access to it. You can even, you know, rent yeah. the equipment you want. So, you, you know, I think it's, you're going to see more grassroots stuff, yeah. you know. And yeah. then we're getting their time. <laughs> well, it, make, and it makes me think also of just how you brand yourselves as um, um, uh, actors has changed a lot. You know, what what used to be possible, you know, what you wear in an audition or how you show up to to an interview or to a meeting is now like how you present yourself in social media, probably. And yeah. what are you doing on TikTok and the following that you get? All of that has uh, has changed tremendously. Uh, following matters. I know casting directors do look at how many followers you have on Facebook and Twitter and these things. They matter like yeah. who follows you. Yeah. Yeah, it indeed. Does. We only have a couple of minutes left and I wish I could have a full other hour. I have so many questions <laughs> for you. Um, uh, really quick question. How did you two meet? <laughs> <laughs> And, and found each other. <laughs> we, like met, the <laughs> we met in Los Angeles through um, a theater that I had helped co-found with 10 other people. There was 11 of us and there were uh, half of the people had gone to Rutgers and Jordan had got her master's in Rutgers and she knew some of those people. And that's the real I, short I had answer. come out to Los Angeles. I, I told you earlier, am I allowed to say that on here? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> so uh, we were at, I, I came to see a play um, yeah. and he was producing it. And uh, there's this little theater company there in Los Angeles. And there was a little party after on closing night. And um, this guy got up on the bleachers and we were all trying to have cake and wine. And he started telling people where they had to go and what they had to do. After the play was over uh, for two hours. They had to you know, wrap the set and everything. And so I turned to my friend and I said, who is that asshole? <laughs> <laughs> and then my friend said, oh, Kilner, ignore him. He's a bonehead. So... Then later we played some football over near Fox, 20th Century Fox, this group of people. And there, was a, there was a party and I was told to follow him to the party because I didn't know how to get there. And so I was following him and he pulled into a 7-Eleven. So I pulled in next to him and I got out and I said, you know, I'm sorry, I'm following you to the party. And you're thinking, you know, you're an asshole. <laughs> so he said, I've, I've got to go get um, some soda. I don't drink. And I said, oh, okay. So we're standing in this 7-Eleven when um, the 7-Eleven got robbed. And the guy jumped over the counter and left. And I stood there talking to him. And I said, so you don't drink? And he said, he goes, no, I do drink. He said, it's just I have an audition in the morning. And I don't drink before an audition because we know it, alcohol puffs up your eyes for camera. So I said, oh. And the I checked in the back of my mind, professional. And we, it worked out that the two of us were the only two really professional working actors in that company at the time. We had both done a lot of television and New York theater and stuff. And I said, oh, they're angry at him because he does the, he does the do. And he's making sure that they do what they're supposed to be doing. So that I started to follow him a little bit. He started following me a little bit. <laughs> and we, we were rebouncing a play that we had done and we lost our stage manager and Jordan needed a I job. I stepped up, I stayed so, so here's a perfect example of, of a really high, and Jordan's considered an, you know, amongst actors, she's considered an actress actor, but she was happy to jump in when she was asked, would you be our stage manager and run the whole show? Yeah, and yeah. she ran us like a Marine drill sergeant. <laughs> I and mean, she had a book this thick full of, you know, each department, lighting, you know, sound uh, rehearsals, you know, it, it, and she really was, and I, and I took note of that. I said, wow, she's really, uh, yeah. she too is really professional. So that's how we met and where we met. And then, um, you know, it was, yeah. uh, it's been a, quite an adventure since then. 
Well, well what, what, a, what, a, what, a, uh, what a delightful conversation we've just had. And um, I can tell you that I know many people have learned a lot from uh, what you shared today, but I learned a ton uh, about how we can follow our dreams, how we can uh, work with fear and uncertainty and failure. Um, there are just so many lessons and nuggets in what you've shared today. So I am eternally grateful, uh, and I know everyone has enjoyed it. Um, so thank you. So we really enjoyed it too. You know, <laughs> I mean, look, we, you have to impart back to people that those experiences you've had. You just have to. Yeah. It's part of the. It's part of how the world works. And I've loved meeting you so many times, and uh, every time I get nuggets from you. So I uh, uh, really uh, uh, appreciate the, uh, this connection that I have with you, and um, thank you for allowing me to just share it with the world. There are Somebody, some comments. Stephen Eddie is saying hi to you, or Edie, Stephen Steve, Steve Eddie, 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 yeah. Eddie, he's saying yeah. hi to you. Farouk, this is yeah. to be continued. This is not the end. All right, let's do it again. And we, uh, and we will come back for part two anytime you want. Yeah. Okay. okay, well, uh, deal. That sounds really yeah. good. Thank you. So I wish okay. you both much success. I want to wish all uh, our audience uh, much success uh, also. And uh, I want to remind everyone what I always say, the only vision that matters is the one that you create. Thank you all so much, and we'll see you next time. Absolutely. Bye.